Hello everybody, today I'm here with Tim Larkin. He is a New York Times best-selling author and creator of the Target Focus Training Method. He is an ex-military advisor, security person, has taught over 10,000 people all around the world in his fighting methods. So I'm super excited to have him on the show and talk a little bit more about how his learnings have actually helped him with his entrepreneurial career, how he's seen other business owners use these methods to actually help them in the business. It seems totally off the radar to me, but I'm super interested in how it all works. So Tim, my man, how are you? Really good. Thanks for having me on. Most welcome. Tim, can you, for those who are hearing of you for the first time, tell us a little bit about your background and your journey so far. Yeah, my uh, my background was uh, I grew up in a Navy family. I was, uh, you know, formerly, you know, uh, lovingly they call us Navy brats. And we uh, we moved, you know, my family moved all around the U.S. and uh, abroad following my dad's career. And um, one of the one of the areas that we ended up in was Coronado, California in San Diego. And that's we literally lived uh, my, my Navy housing was literally across the street from where the SEAL teams train at basic underwater demolition school. So around 13 years old, I got exposed to the SEAL teams and I just thought it was the greatest career ever. And I couldn't believe they got paid to do stuff like that. And, um, it was long before, I mean, I'm older now and, and this was before the SEALs were really as big as they are today. Like everybody knows about the SEALs today, but back in the, um, you know, late seventies, early eighties, nobody really knew much about the SEALs. If you were in the right you know, part of the world. And I just happened to be in the right part of the world where, you know, they literally were housed. So, uh, you know, I got involved in that, um, idea that I was going to do that prep for it, went to college, um, became a, uh, you know, a, a candidate, a seal candidate. You know, when I got out of college, I, I grabbed one or two slots. I was bigger, faster, and stronger. I was the best in my class all of those things. A couple of weeks before graduation, I had something happen to me that never happened before. I had an injury happen to my body. I was underneath uh, doing a dive, ax, uh, a dive, really simple dive too. I'd make it through all the hardest evolutions of SEAL training. And this very simple dive, I had, uh, had uh, a head cold that day and it caused some congestion and I ended up blowing my eardrum. And when I did that, um, the semicircular canals emptied out of uh, my ear, my inner ear, and I lost all control of my body as far as, uh, you know, what direction I was at, you know, all my balance. And it literally, in seconds, ended my career. I had, uh, it was the first time I had really been injured where I had zero control over my body. You know, I, I couldn't will my way out of it. I couldn't, you know, just uh, gut it out. None of those things worked at all. I was, I truly was at the mercy of the reaction uh, to the trauma. And that, uh, that basically ended my career as a SEAL before it even started. And then uh, they switched me over into the intelligence community. And that's where I worked. I worked actually for the Admiral of the SEAL teams. And uh, when I was there, we were switching over from the Soviet Union, you know, focusing on the Soviet Union to focusing on basically what we're dealing with today, you know, tribal conflicts and, you know, all these, uh, these brush wars. We, back then we called it low intensity conflict. Um, but you're seeing it today and, and, and the training changed. And I got involved in a group that was looking at the idea that, hey, we're going to have to put our hands on people again. Um, you know, we're actually going to have to go door to door. We're going to have to do all these things. And so hand to hand combat actually became very, um, important. And I was in a beta group. I had a martial arts background and they put me in a beta group, not because I deserved to be in it, but just because I was a young guy. Most of the guys at my command were senior people. They were the legends of the SEAL teams and they liked me. Um, I, I was good at my job, my intelligence job. And, uh, they included me in this uh, program where we were searching for the new hand to hand combat system. And uh, that would go forward, and I was part of that. And that system that we started with back then evolved. I became an instructor, and uh, when I got out of the Navy, I got out of the Navy right after Panama, uh, and I was in the reserves through Gulf War One. And during that time, I stayed on with the with the instructor who started doing this hand-to-hand -hand combat series and I started, you know, helping him out a little bit. I was going to take a six month break after the Navy and it turned into, you know, 15 years. Well, now it's, you know, 20, 22 years later. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still on that break. Um, doing it. Uh, 
the the big thing that is relevant to your folks is the idea that um, you know most people look at the idea of dealing with imminent violence and they they say okay how does that translate to you know anything useful for me as far as business or anything like that and what we found is a lot of the things when you're making life or death decisions the the methodologies that you use and the, and the, the practices that you use for that type of thinking work even better when it's not as severe meaning you know, uh, when your life isn't on the line, the decision making that works when it is, is extremely useful, especially to an, entre- an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, so so that to me is really interesting. I, I always talk to people that you, the mind is your, your primary weapon. And we as entrepreneurs know that we feed our mind, um, you know, with, with all the right information, principles, and in life or death situations, you learn very quickly that you want to be always in the effect state. You want to be causing the effect. I mean, I'm sorry, you want to be in the cause state. You want to be causing effects. You don't want to be in the effect state where you're reacting to somebody else. And uh, it's extremely important, you know, like uh, to give an illustration, it would be like all of a sudden you're walking out of a restaurant one night, you walk around the corner, and then you're, you're mugged. You're thrown up against the wall, you know, hands are on your throat, and knives to your throat, and... If your first thought process is, oh, my gosh, he's choking me, he has a knife to my throat, rather than being in the cause state, and the cause state would be like, okay, I know where his hands are at. You know, I'm still thinking, I can still think and move, therefore, what's available to me? And then you look immediately at what your options are. And, and again, that puts you back in into control at that point. Um, and, and the same thing with entrepreneurs. You know, we have entrepreneurs oftentimes that they get frozen by too much, too many options. And the physical training, when I take people through where you have to make your own decisions, what, what's interesting, there's a kinesthetic learning process in that. And they come back, like I've had t- the Merck traders, you know, the, the top, top guys from the Merck exchange in New York, the top guys from the Chicago exchange, guys that are literally, you know, betting millions on commodities. And these guys came out of the training. I trained both groups after trading hours for a week straight. And... They came out of it, and they were the ones that came after me and said, you've improved our trading. You've improved us. We understand now that until we take action, you know, we're not going to be – it's not going to be paralysis by analysis. We understand that until I actually execute my trade, nothing happens just because I understood as soon as – when my life's on the line, until I affect an injury on the other guy and control his brain, nothing happens in my favor. And uh, it was really interesting. That's where, you know, I didn't come – when I, I train an awful lot of entrepreneurs. I've gone all over the world with a uh, young president's organization. Um, I've trained, you know, some of the top, you know, names in, in the entrepreneurial world. And it didn't start out with me doing it for any other reason other than I wanted to, um, you know, give them self-protection training because, you know, a lot of them are very um, high profile individuals and they, they needed that. Um, what was interesting is training incredibly smart people like that. They look at your principles and methods and they give it a lateral approach and they're able to they're able to you know actually use that in ways that you never you never thought you know your training methodologies would be used okay so really they're taking what you've given them and using it to control their mental states in other high pressure environments yeah i had i have one female entrepreneur and she was in a really really nasty um legal battle and she found herself, she said, you know, I, I, I was there, I was taking all this advice from some advisors where I was basically reacting to everything that they were throwing at me and I was trying to appease people. And I quickly realized, I was thinking back to my training with you where it was like, hey, you know, are you in the cause state or are you in the effect state? And she said, I started getting in the cause state. I stopped ignore. I started to ignore what they were doing to me. I started focusing on what I wanted to do and I started to making my demands and countering and coming in and she said it was amazing the the mindset change and the how I was able to you know turn things around for myself just by getting back into the cause state and she said I never would have it never would have triggered until you know you told me about that an easy way for you know it, it, I don't want people to think they have to come to my training for this you can you can do this right now it's it's one of those things that we all experience especially you know in this day of distraction with all the technologies that we have and um, you know, all the demands on our attention. Basically, if you come in in the morning 
and you've decided, okay, there are three things I need to accomplish before noon today, and I'm gonna, I'm going to completely focus on these three things because they're gonna make the biggest difference, you know, in, in my outcome, in my my outcome for my my uh, business. And you catch yourself, you know, you're, you're you're doing you're doing great in your first hour, everything's going well, and then all of a sudden you hear that ding of you know Outlook or whatever your email service is that there's a new email. As soon as you take your focus off of whatever you've been doing and you just take that first click on that email and you look, you've just gone from being in cause state to effect state. So so what I do is I have clients in a very non-threatening way start catching themselves in the effect state. And what happens is when you start realizing, you know, first it's the realization and then you, you get really overloaded. You can you realize how much of your life you are reacting rather than causing the reactions. And once you start taking control of that, you know, in these small ways, it's amazing how in the bigger ways, it's easier for you to block off time and get real work done. That's interesting. You mentioned earlier that you dealt with some alternative entrepreneurs um, through the prison systems. Can you tell us a little bit about those yes. stories? Yeah, well, I, for this last book, uh, I have a, my, my book that is currently um, about to be released, When Violence is the Answer, I went into the prison systems. I have really good connections with, with the corrections agencies. And I went to the prison systems to study basically how they use the tool of violence. Um, they use violence in a very different manner than, say, like what, what, what we think. You know, we look at like the UFC. We look at combat sports. We look at the media and Hollywood, and that's really where we get our ideas of what we think violence is. Um, and all of that is basically the gamification of violence. It's not the direct method use of violence. Um, it's it's really reserved. You know, the combat sport world is really reserved for the elite athletes. Um, and the only way you can gamify violence is if you take injury to the human body out of the equation. And we all know the difference between that. If you say you're watching a, uh, um, you know, you're watching, say, a, a football match, like a soccer match, and, you know, you got two great competitors going, one, one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the players is going after the ball. He goes to try to take the ball away. He misses. You know, he doesn't hit the ball, but he lands on the ankle of the other competitor. And the other competitor, who was fully engaged in the, in the sport at that time, fully engaged, you know, moving the ball down the, down the pitch, all of a sudden, you know, his ankle is snapped and his whole world becomes that. His whole world becomes focused. You know, this highly trained athlete now is completely focused on the fact that he has a broken ankle. And the, the crowd understands that. Whereas if the uh, player had you know, successfully taking the ball away or something, there would have been a huge cheer. Now, when they see that the uh, ankle is broken, the whole crowd gets that internal feeling where you recognize, oh, this is an injury. This is something that's serious. This is going to end this kid's ability to play right now. And we all feel it. And, and people go from cheering to just kind of like, you know, like, internal almost like, you know, moaning, like, oh, hey. You hear full crowds do that. Um, that's the difference. The injury to the human body is um, something that takes away bigger, faster, stronger. That's why they have to take injury out of the rules. Um, uh, you know, the last time I looked at the, the UFC, it had 31 rules. 27 of them, I believe, involved, were solely about injury to the human body, direct injury to the human body, prohibiting it. And the reason is, is because you can't have a game, you can't have a contest, an athletic contest, if injury is involved, because injury bypasses bigger, faster, stronger. Um, and, we, and we all know that. Now, if you want to know how to protect yourself, and if you want to know how to deal with bigger, faster, stronger threats, well, then you focus on, you know, injury to the human body. The prisoners figured this out. The prison gangs, because violence to them is just like an entrepreneur. Violence is their currency. Violence, the successful use of the tool of violence allows them to run the prison, to run all the business of the prison, all the drugs that come in and out of the prison. It allows them to control distribution of the drugs on the streets because their gangs are so powerful um, that they're literally are running the, 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 um, they are running the streets. But their commodity is violence. 
And uh, it was really fascinating when I started to study it, the similarities between the entrepreneurs that I've worked with and how they run their businesses and how they vet people and how they, you know, go after market share. And then looking at these prison gangs and seeing that very, very similar aspects. And sometimes I kept, you know, grudgingly not I'm not glorifying these guys, but giving grudging respect to the fact that um, oftentimes the prisoners were far more effective in their ability to vet people and get things done uh, with, you know, no, uh, no access to any of the latest technology, no access to a lot of the, um, you know, the things that you and I take for granted uh, of there. They did not, they basically took a very low, co- uh, low tech, high concept approach to running their businesses. And they're running transnational businesses that are executing billions of dollars of sales with hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of distributors that they're controlling. And they're controlling them from the shot callers, the main guys, are incarcerated 23 out of 24 hours a day with no contact with another human being. And yet they're able to communicate during that one hour everything that needs to be communicated and distributed throughout there. The overriding way they're able to do that is through the successful threat of violence if their actions aren't taken out. Uh, what was so interesting was I saw this and, and I was, I was looking at this and as I was doing all my studies, I was like, this is fascinating. I said, it's fascinating how these guys are running. Their similarities are there, but I said, geez, I don't want to even, I don't even want to broach the subject with my, cause I run these weird worlds. You know, I'm, I'm in my world where I'm doing this training and I'm very comfortable, you know, dealing with the prison systems, dealing with personalities like this and training the, the elite units that I train. The other side of me is I have a bunch of friends in the entrepreneurial community. I'm in a lot of masterminds. I'm in, you know, I build my own business. I get a lot of great information from this and I exchange a lot of great information and I couldn't help but see the correlation. But I was, I was sitting there saying, this is too crazy. I couldn't present this to my entrepreneur group. And then I saw an article that was run in the LA Times where a YPO group, and it was one of the ones that I had trained years ago, actually went and made a donation to a law enforcement group, they were able to secure a meeting with a guy named Rene Enriquez. He's called the boxer. He's the highest uh, member of the Mexican mafia to defect. They had, they had put out a hit on him, and he defected to law enforcement. And he basically was debriefed, and they brought him in for the specific aspect of how do you market, control, and run a transnational business that runs billions of dollars when you're, all your main um, management, senior management, is incarcerated 23 hours a day. That's, that was the main thing. It was almost verbatim what I, had, what I had been seeing. And the YPL group there is a wildly controversial. They got uh, the actual the, the local law enforcement people got in a lot of trouble because it was seen as oh, somehow they were glorifying it. But to me, it validated exactly what I was looking at, that oftentimes the best information comes from the worst people. And, you know, there was a lot of useful information that this guy was able to, to, to pass on to the entrepreneurs. You know, their vetting processes are, are, are much more strict. Their education process of anybody who's going to be in senior leadership. Um, was really interesting. I'll give you a quick uh, idea. They, they talk about the education process. So if one, so there's about 150 uh, senior people in the Mexican mafia. And, and if you get selected, you get selected from the tens of thousands of street gangs, the Sereno or Norteño street gangs that are out there. It's the Sereños for uh, Mexican mafia. Um, to be invited in, there you go through a process, and one of those things is education. He listed the book list that he has that they have their senior people read, and it were, were there, a lot of them were books that many of the entrepreneurs will be familiar with, books like The Forty Eight Laws of Power, Machiavelli's The Prince. Um, you had like nor, Abnormal Psychology, NLP. A lot of the a lot of those books were 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 absolute you know uh, things. The uh, The Art of War, you know uh, Sun Tzu's uh, Art of War, um, the Book of Five Rings. These are all books that, that oftentimes you'll see top entrepreneurs reading for strategy. 
they are also books that they're just about every one of those books was a book were books that I had to read as a young officer, a young intelligence officer at the JFK Special Warfare Center in uh, Fort Bragg when I was going through some of my training. What was not in that training, though, the only differentiation was the Mexican Mafia has and also the Aryan Brotherhood and also the Black Gorilla family, which are three of the, the largest, most powerful groups in the prison systems. Um they all have the requirement to study anatomy. And the reason he gives, he gives the reason when he got down to anatomy and he just, it's, it's fascinating during the interview. He kind of tries to gloss over it really quick. He said, we have to know anatomy because we need to know how to kill because that's how we derive our power. And from power, we run the streets and we're able to make our money. And he just kind of glosses over, but their currency is successful use of violence. If you switched out violence or anatomy for say, marketing, you know, marketing knowledge or something or, you know, some lead generation or, or some other thing, some other, you know, revenue generator, um, that would that would be the only differentiation in there. That's that's where theirs comes from. And what's very interesting is it, it, it requires a highly disciplined approach. They are hyper um, rational. Uh, that was the other thing that I found out that the decision making for the for these groups is absolutely rational because they can't just randomly use violence. We have this idea that, you know, prison is chaotic and that it's just randomly violent. There's there's really nothing random about it. Everything has to be sanctioned because everything affects money there and everything affects power. And so it's just the same way that you would come up. An entrepreneur would come up with a strategic marketing plan and what the effects would be. And, and all that, they, they look at everything they do there. So there were many correlations. I could understand why the YPO group looked that way. But again, it was this unconventional area that you would think there would be absolutely nothing to learn from these guys. And yet you come away with grudging respect for how they execute the organization skills and, and how they're able to do things with none of the things that we take for granted as far as technology, as far as business applications and communication. So really the cause and effect of, of the violence, will like that, how it will affect the business. Yes, but things are absolutely, I mean, it, you know, clear, clear delineation. You talk about delegating, you know, delegating is huge there and they have to make sure that they can delegate effectively and, and that, you know, people understand that when something's delegated to them, they have to execute it properly. It's amazing how, and it's not just all through, you know, you think it's through all this thuggish, it, there's actually a high level of respect. These guys, if you saw this, uh, the video of this guy talking, Rene Enriquez, he, he sounds like a Fortune 100 CEO. He speaks, he, he speaks amazingly well. And except for the neck tattoo, you can see a little bit of a neck tattoo. He has a, he has a, in, during this debrief, he has a suit on. But if you, didn't see a little bit of the neck tattoo hanging out of his, you know, collar, you would have no idea. You would think you were talking to a Fortune 100 CEO. Judging by these books they're reading and the level of execution you're talking about, these are really highly intelligent people. Yeah, they, they, that's just that we would like to think that they're all knuckle draggers and and unintelligent. And he sa and he says, oh yeah, we have those guys. But he goes, those are the no accounts. Those are the knuckle draggers. Those are the ones that we just, you know, use. He goes, but if you're going to, you know, run the organizations that we run and do what you need, he, you know, these guys would be highly successful if they were able to take those skill sets and apply them elsewhere. It, you know, they'd be probably highly successful in what they do because, again, it runs along the same tenets that any successful startup and entrepreneur and then large company does to dominate a market they totally understand uh, you know how to control distribution they totally understand market share they understand marketing lead generation all of that you know they do it in horrific you know very damaging ways you know getting people hooked on drugs and things of that nature but what is interesting is the, the reason I like to use this uh, analogy is because I often go places to masterminds and stuff and a lot of the complaining I hear about is, you know, well, I'm not able to do this because I don't have X or I don't have access to this or my database isn't big enough or this, you know, all these things, all these excuses for not taking action. And when you look back on these individuals who literally are doing this in the most extreme conditions, 
they they really are creative thinkers and they're also very principle based thinkers. Everything is run on principles because they can't rely on the latest methods because latest methods are not available to them, but they can be very principled in their approach and they can be very, very creative in how they execute things. And, um, you know, it, what it does, it spurs on, you know, entrepreneurs when they think that they, they need to be reliant on the latest technology or, you know, the late, whatever the latest, um, you know, fad is in, uh, in business. It's really minimal approach to get the most done. That's fascinating. Yeah. How yeah. Do you, okay, take it eighty twenty year for this. What is the most effective way that entrepreneurs can take these learnings and start using their own businesses? Should they be reading these books to really start getting that base knowledge? Yeah, really, it's 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 becoming it's becoming principle based. You know, um, that you know, like I uh, in, in teaching my 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 approach to teaching people how to use the tool of violence, I basically teach. I give them the principles of using, I teach them how to use the tool rather than teach them in techniques, you know, technique based situation versus a, a, uh, um, you know, a principle based situation. Principle based training is far more flexible and long time usable to, to entrepreneurs. And the difference I get is like a lot of what's out there, you know, in, in my world, a lot of what's out there is basically teaching multiplication one equation at a time. Meaning people come to me and they'll say things like, hey, Tim, okay, uh, what are the top three targets to get? You know, and what they're really saying is, hey, I, I don't want to think. I, I just want, you know, give me something that's the top three. Whereas if I said, if I turned it around and, you know, if it was their business and I told like a doctor, I said, hey, okay, hey, give me the top three incisions to make when I got to do surgery. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, we, we, we wouldn't accept that in anything else. What we want to know is you want to know the principles and you want to know how to multiply because if I just give you three equations to memorize, you know, 12 times 12, 44 times 67 and 87 times nine, you're going to feel really good because you're going to know the answers and you're going to drill that time and time again. Just like in my world, people drill these techniques, these specific techniques, the guy approaches from the right. I do this, I do that. But I mean, you feel really good about yourself. Problem is, in the real world, we have no idea how things are going to happen. And so what we need is we need a principle. We need the principles of multiplication so that no matter what the integers are coming in, we can solve the problem because we know how to multiply. We didn't just memorize three equations. Um, and it's the same thing here. So, so principle-based training is going to require you to be a, a deeper thinker. And it's not going to give you a specific answer for a specific problem right away, meaning, you know, you, you really need to take time to train yourself. These are timeless principles that, uh, that, that you can learn. You know, the books that we talked about, you know, they provide timeless uh, information. And, um, you know, I think that's why stoic philosophy is very big right now in the entrepreneurial world, um, because that literally is it's, it's that type of thinking has really had the test of time and it, it really has is extremely helpful especially if you're going to be an entrepreneur i can see the attraction of of learning stoicism and applying you know some of the tenets of stoicism um again timeless stuff i mean literally stuff that was written thousands of years ago that uh people can easily apply it's just as relevant today if you read marcus aurelius uh you know meditations he's talking about very, you could update that and it could be like you're reading Elon Musk's diary or something today. You know, I mean, it's all the same, it's all the same issues that humans have had to deal with and, and delve with. And, um, you know, when I, when I wrote this book, it's the same thing. You know, violence is a, a subject that everybody uh, ignores. Everybody just shuns. We've been told that, you know, we stigmatize the idea of studying violence to the point to where the only people that have it available to them are the predators. And, you know, what I've gone out of my way to show is that by studying violence, there's a lot of benefits to studying violence. Violence is a it's a uh, it's a life skill that everybody should have at least base awareness of just like swimming. You know, we should all know how to we don't all have to be Michael Phelps, but we all should be able to get out of the pool if we fall in the water um, safely. You know, we should be able to swim to shore if we fall in, if we fall in off the boat. 
Um, you know, all these, these are basic things. We've lost that. You know, violence, we've stigmatized it to the point to where we say that, oh, no, no, you can't even look at the subject um, because that'll make you criminal. And yet it's uh, it's a skill set that is so inherent and so wrapped up in the human race that it's, you know, uh, that the reason, you know, we in the Western world are able to live the lives we're able to live is because we have been so good at doing violence. You know, if, if we as a species, if we just look at our species as humans, we're not the biggest, fastest, and strongest. But our brains have given us the ability to make tools, and we've become extremely good at protecting ourselves and viol- and, and in using the tool of violence judiciously. Um, now, a lot of people have been using the tool of violence for criminal use, and that's the problem. Right now, those those people far outnumber the people that know how to use it judiciously. Um, and so the idea is, you know, just like any other set of principles that you'd learn, you know, these principles probably can make ultimately the biggest difference in your life should you ever be facing grievous bodily harm. And I think that's why the entrepreneurs that I've trained have been able to see the correlation between, oh, I get it, you know, it, this is life or death. The byproduct is I get to I get some really good self-protection training. But it also clarifies my thinking in my business to make sure that I'm always looking to be in the cause state and that I'm always looking to meet, be the one that is causing the reaction and not be reacting the whole time, being in the effect state. And it's just this physical manifestation of you, you know, actually kinesthetically doing the training and feeling this and then, you know, having it sink in that these principles stick with you that way, far beyond just the idea of self-protection. Tell us a bit more about your own business and how this has impacted, these principles have impacted the way you've approached growing yours. Um, with my business, uh, you know, the probably the greatest thing that, that I recognized uh, in, in my business was the model prior to us getting into it was really guru based. It was really about you know, the chest thumping, there's a lot of chest thumping, you know, you got to do it my way. I, I'm the greatest, you know, there's a lot of people out there that most of the students, all they can say is, wow, my instructor's so great, you know, <laughs> and, and that's awesome. That that's great, but it really doesn't do much for you. You know, the really what you want to say, Hey, wh- what did your instructor do for you? You know, you started out here and where did he take you? You know, and, and, and it's really what we flipped on us was we flipped it from an idea of how can we constantly improve our methods? Our principles are rock solid, but we can constantly improve our methods to get better results. I want, you know, for the amount of time that you spend with me, I want you to be better than I was after that many hours, you know, of, of the way I learned it. I wish the current program that we have today and the methods that we use, I wish that was the way I was initially trained, you know, almost 26 years ago. Um, but you know, I, I would, I would love to go through the instructor training that we have now versus the instructor training that I went through years ago. It was great. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it, we, we now have methods that get us there much faster, much more direct, and we're able to be much more effective. Yeah. Yeah. How did you become a New York Times bestseller other than having awesome content? I think, uh, I think a lot of it is the message. I think a lot of it was the fact that it didn't hurt that Tony Robbins, you know, is a client of mine and that he really pushed for me, you know, it's one of those things, but I, I didn't go out seeking Tony. Tony found me and really what became a big believer. And I think, I think that's it. I think if you stick to what you're doing, I had no intention of, of becoming an author. Um, I had, I had actually met uh, a great author uh, that every entrepreneur should read the book called The War of Art by Steve Pressfield. Uh, Steve Pressfield is just a great guy, and, and I met Steve. I had the pleasure of meeting him, God, almost 14 years ago when um, he took me to dinner. And he's, Steve's written a, a lot of great books, and he heard me talk about the subject of violence during that time. He was asking me all these questions, and he said, why haven't you written a book? And I said, well, Steve, nobody wants to hear about this. I said, this is, this, this is too extreme for most people. And he said, Tim, I've been sitting here almost three hours. He goes, with my jaw dropped. He goes, write the book. He said, trust me, write the book. 
Um, and Steve is really the reason, you know, I, I really became an author. I started write, you know, writing blogs and doing things like that and sharing the ideas be outside of the circles, you know, certain, you know, with the general public. And then it was Tony who really took me to the next level and, you know, basically kicked me in the ass and said, you need to go meet this person, boom, get this book out, get it done. And, um, you know, that's Tony. And, then and, and that was it, you know, that was, he basically got me on my way and people really responded to the message. I mean, the New York Times bestseller is, it's nice to have. It really is. Uh, you know, the publishing world is, is really a joke. Um, they're, they're so far behind the times. I mean, any competent entrepreneur looking at the way the publishing world is currently working today, it's just Byzantine. Um, but that said, I appreciate, I appreciate being on the list and I appreciate the fact that people are responsive to my books. But I mean, when you see some of the weird algorithms they use, um, to, to get you there, it's, it's, it's strange. Um, luckily, you know, I actually have real sales and verifiable sales and, and I sell long beyond just the, you know, the first week or something, you know, when we do that. So, um, that's, uh. That, that's kind of how, how you do it. I, that, I that probably didn't give you the specific. You're probably looking for, hey, go hire this guy, and they're going to get you on the New York Times list. Um, there are groups that, like that that are out there. But, again, when we, when we talk about the idea, that's, that's the idea of learning one or two multiplication equations. They'll get you on for maybe a day, um, but there will be no sustainability. You have to have the message and the principles and you have to take a long tail approach to selling the books. And now this latest book, this is going to be my platform for quite some time. This is going to be my, this is the book I've wanted to write for some, quite some time. And I'm going to turn it into a lead generation product. It's going to be my, you know, for new clients, this is going to be a, a hallmark of where they start. I'm going to put a whole product line around this. In fact, everybody that's pre-ordering right now, I'm already starting to build that process. I'm doing 10 module free video um, program for anybody that, that buys the book. And the reason I'm sharing this with everybody is, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd love you. I'd love everybody listening to go out and go do this. But from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I'm going to use that 10 modules to basically find out what all these people are interested in. They're going to go into each one of the chapters and then we're going in depth. I'm going to have their questions. They're going to be sending me questions and that I'll be answering. So I'm going to learn an awful lot of data of what people are interested in, what they're responding to. And it helps me create the right product lines, the right trainings, and all of these. So I, I really strategically am looking forward to the next 18 months of collecting a, a lot of really useful data and then using that to really improve my delivery you know, of uh, information to the business. What products and services are currently in your own business? I'm sorry, what did you say? What? what are the current services in your own business? So you've got the, the publishings, the books, you've got training yeah. for organizations like YPO. Is that consulting yeah. or how do you? Yeah, that's speaking, speaking, speaking for the most part. Okay. Yeah, speak, speak for the most part. But I, you know, 90% of my business is uh, um, content, uh, is delivering information content. And then the big change that I'm doing right now is I am going to be transferring, uh, transforming over into basically, uh, you know, uh, r really delving into streaming um, applications and online education and uh, basically recurring, you know, recurring revenue, basically creating, uh, <clears throat> creating a, a real online community. That's the one thing that we've been a little bit behind the power curve in. Um, and I'm very excited that I'm going to be able to share my content and, you know, put it out there in a way that can create literally a worldwide community. I mean, it's amazing the the reach that I have now that you know the client base that I have is literally around the world and having a really good strong online platform that's going to allow people to also access via uh, you know Amazon TV and uh, Apple TV and Roku and all the all the new platforms that are out there uh, it, it'll be it's just going to really give a quantum leap to where I can deliver you know, our message and our training, I can have the, my best trainers can train people literally worldwide, um, you know, via, via this platform. And, um, that's going to be really, really exciting. Okay. So for him that right, your goal right now is to make it more accessible to the average person. Yeah. Well, the, that, that's where the demand is right now. And that's where everything's going. Everything's going to, uh, to online, you know, the world's really changed. I mean, uh, you know, it used to be information products and everybody's there. Really, what you have to do now is you have to provide 
Um, you, you really have to provide a community. I mean, could somebody go out there and on YouTube get a lot of free information and probably parse together a fairly decent training? They probably could. Um, what people are going to pay for now is not necessarily content. They're going to pay for edited content. And what I mean by that is, you know, you could go other places to learn um, self-protection training. But I think my methods are the most direct uh, for, for people that are worried about life or death situations. I think that's my, that's my niche. That's where I'm really good. And um, if you want to understand how to do that, I believe my principles and methods are going to get you there the fastest. And that's what people are willing to pay for, They're, you know, curated content that actually is going to you know, deliver, not just a bunch of random content that's being thrown there that you kind of got to figure it out for your own because time is precious. And especially my clients, a lot of them are entrepreneurs, high, uh, you know, high net worth individuals. Time is precious to them. Therefore they don't want to have to figure stuff out for themselves. If they have an interest, they want the best information and they want it delivered in the best platform, you know, in the most efficient way. So my goal is to make you effective first and to make you effective. I have to introduce you to the right things then to make you efficient. I'm going to take those right things and I'm going to show you how to do them the right way. And that's really what people, um, you know, in this day and age will pay for because there, there's just too much. If you can't deliver content that way, if you just think you're going to just throw up, you know, content and you're not going to create um, value, you know, in the value and being like, hey, this is really well thought out content. It is edited correctly. It is curated correctly. And oh, by the way, you know, there's a community behind it. You guys can actually exchange information and, and talk. If, you, if you're not building that, you're, it's going to be very tough for you to just uh, do the old model of just selling you know, information products. That's cool. That's really cool. So that thinking, who has impacted you in that way? Because you've had some brilliant minds that you've been involved with over the years yourself. But who has been the most impactful for yourself? I think I, there have been a variety of people. Uh, you know, I've mentioned Stephen Pressfield. You know, I mentioned Tony Robbins. Obviously, those guys are just amazing. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are authors that that are great. I got a lot of friends in the business community, um, names that people would know and then don't know um, that are just absolutely brilliant. Um, I sat down one evening. I was in Prague um, at a YPO university where I was presenting. And I was in a discussion with a bunch of guys, and there were a bunch of guys who were basically getting ready to sell their cable. Uh, they were in the Midwest, and they were selling their cable news uh, organizations, uh, not, not just news, but you know, cable subsidiaries. They were going to sell them to, I believe it was either Time Warner or Cox. They were getting ready to go. And they were talking with me, and they were watching my stuff, and they said, you know, in the next 10 years – you you're actually in a really good position they said because you have content and content is people are going to be really looking for content he said things are going to get broken up here it's not going to be this traditional deal where there's only like so many channels he said it's going to be next to unlimited and people are going to be searching out specific information he goes you already have an awful lot and he goes you've already thought out an awful lot of content he said you really should think about you know, curating that and prepping for this. He said it's going to get to the point to where it's going to be, you know, economical enough for anybody to be able to offer their own content. And I remember, you know, thinking at the time, because it was still wildly expensive to do video back then, um, and, and the type of streaming video he was talking about was, like, almost unthinkable unless you were going to have your own TV show, which would, you know, which was, was really tough to do back then. Um, now you look at it, and he was dead right. And he actually, you know, prep me for this and I, I you know luckily I'm in a very good position right now where I've documented a lot of my content I have years worth of content to share with people um, and I know how to I know how to program it in a way that's uh, you know compelling and useful to people awesome. and that and that was and that was all just because I gave a presentation in New York one time to a group of bankers one of the guys happened to be in YPO and he said You've got to come to Mexico City. He, they were doing some program in Mexico City. He just said, "You've got to give this presentation." He goes, "I can give you three hours." He was he was running the, he was running the university. He goes, "I'll give you three hours," and I'm like, "I'd never, I had never presented anything less than two days, you know, in trainings before." And I was thrown that opportunity, and I jumped at it. I, I said, "You know what? This is a really interesting group. I have no idea where this is going to go." 
Um, my whole world had been military and law enforcement for the most part and really specialized corporate training. Um, and because I said yes, having no clue what the hell I was going to train these guys in, what I thought what they'd be interested in, I just jumped on a plane, went down and did it. And it ended up giving me just access to a world I, I didn't even know existed uh, with YPO. They were just amazing. They literally took me through 52 countries. Um, I got to meet, you know, the YPO is just an incredible organization as far as access and, you know, thinking and um, met some incredible thinkers and guys that have remained friends, you know, to this day that I'm able to just call up and thankfully just run things by them that, you know, most people couldn't get access to people like that. That's so awesome. I wish I could tell you it was all plan- planned out, but I think a lot of it is just if you're passionate about what you do and you really care, you really care about your delivery and you really care there, you know, when opportunity comes, you're going to have things like this. You're going to have, uh, you know, somebody that says, hey, I need you to go here. I need you to meet this person. And then, you know, you're, you're just at the time you're just ready. It goes back to the saying you can't connect the dots looking forwards. You can only connect them looking back on what's already happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. My question to you, though, on a somewhat different line of thinking, if you could go back to the beginning of leaving the Navy and starting to do your own private trainings, what would you have done differently? Um, I, you know, I say this, uh, I say this all the time, especially for entrepreneurs. Uh, I would have, I would have exited out of toxic relationships as early as possible. I stayed in bad personal relationships and bad business relationships far too long. Um, a lot of that was flaw from my, my Navy years and the idea of if you make a deal, you make a deal, uh, you stick with it. But, you know, oftentimes you learn in the business world that you have to, um, you have to have, you know, if you're, if you're in a deal, you have to have both sides working. Okay. And, um, I, that, that's the biggest thing I tell to any young entrepreneur, anybody that's out there. If, if you're in a toxic relationship, be it a personal relationship with a significant other, or a, a business relationship, even if you think that person is one of these, you know, we all think there are people that can't be replaced, guarantee you uh, people can be replaced. And, and your mental health is, is the thing to protect because my biggest problems and my biggest challenges have come from um, keeping toxic relationships far longer than they ever should have been. Brilliant. Mate, if people want to connect with you further and obviously you get the book, where can they go and what's the next step from here? Well, if they go to, if they go to, there, there's many places they can connect with me. I'm on Twitter. I'm on, you know, uh, Instagram. It's all under, if you just go TFT Tim Larkin, you can find me that way. Um, but probably the platform, either Facebook, it's Target Focus Trading or Tim Larkin. If you go to my website, timlarkin.com, uh, you can sign up for the book. Uh, pre-order the book there on Amazon, and then enroll in a, in the free 10-week course. It, it's an amazing value. And again, I, I tell people this because anybody that knows, I, you know, some of the entrepreneurs I know out there will laugh. Anybody that's ever written a book, you know, I have a publisher. It's not a moneymaker. It's the worst way in the world to try to make money. If I had self-published, I would have been killing it. So I could say, yeah, yeah, I'm making money here, but I'm not doing it. I really want to get this message out. Um there's a lot of resistance. I'm getting a lot of great help and support. You know, people like you are putting me on their podcasts and helping me spread the message. But because the word violence is in my title, a lot of people are getting the wrong idea. And um, so what I did was I said, hey, I'm going to give a $300 value for somebody that spends $17 on a book. Um, and uh, that's what I do with this video program, you know, that's there. And so if they go to, you know, timlarkin.com, they can sign up for it there. And if they don't want to get the book, there's also lots of free information there too. I really believe in giving out a lot of content um, because I want to make sure I'm the right fit with people. You know, I want to make sure they get enough of an idea of what our approach is and, and what we're all about to see whether or not, you know, we're a right fit as far as, you know, having some sort of a business relationship. Love it. Guys, go check Tim's book out, order it, make sure you sign up and enjoy these bonuses that he's offering because that is incredible value. 
And honestly, just go read the books he's recommended because those seem like the perfect way for entrepreneurs to get ahead. Until next time, we'll see you all on the next episode.